Welcome to discussion 4C, the committee system. These are our topics for today. What are the different types of committees? How does committee membership in the House compare to the Senate? And how are committee chairs and committee memberships determined? So the committee system is so important to how Congress does its business. Woodrow Wilson said Congress in session is Congress on exhibition whilst Congress in its committee rooms is Congress at work. And this is especially true today. Committees are important in the House, maybe more so than the Senate, simply because of the size of the House. Subcommittees also allow for greater specialization, where members of Congress can work on committees where they really have expertise and knowledge. The committee system started in 1816, uh, and more committees have been added since then. There's usually, in the Senate, less deference to work done in committees compared to the House. So they're especially true and important in the House. Now there are many different types of committees. There's actually four different types of committees that we're going to go over. So the first one is the Standing Committee, and that's what most committees are in Congress. The, they're called Standing because they continue from one Congress to the next. So every two years when we have a new Congress, the standing committees will be the same. Will be, they'll continue from one con Congress to the next. Maybe new ones get added, but the committees exist for long periods of time. They're more or less permanent. These are the committees to which bills are referred to for consideration. Both the House and the Senate have standing committees. Some examples of very powerful Standing committees include the House Ways and Means Committee that deals with a lot of tax policy, the House Rules Committee, and in both houses there's a Judiciary Committee, the Finance Committee, the Appropriations Committees, and Energy Committee. So that's what most committees in Congress are, standing committees. There are joint committees. These include members from both houses who conduct investigations on special issues. So these committees are meant to expedite or speed up business between the house, both houses and to help focus attention on specific matters. So as an example, you can see the image from the, the banner for the Joint Committee on Taxation. So that would include members of both houses. They're not permanent, but they do last for a couple of, of sessions of Congress. There are conference committees. This is a special type of joint committee that forms once a bill has passed both the House and the Senate because there will be differences in the versions of the bills that have passed the House and the Senate. And a conference committee is a committee that reconciles the differences in the versions of the bills that get passed in the House and the Senate. So they're made up of House and Senate members who are originally on the standing committees that worked on the bill. And in conference committee, compromises worked out between the two versions of the bills that get passed. And then the last committee is called a select or a special committee. These are temporary committees appointed to conduct investigations or studies and report back to the chamber that established them. So a famous select or special committee has been the House Select Committee on Benghazi that's been investigating what happened uh, in Benghazi, Libya. There's also the House Rules Committee. This exists only in the House it is a committee that's more or less permanent. The majority party in the House has members that are appointed directly by the Speaker to the Rules Committee. It's such an important committee in how the House operates. It reviews most bills after being reviewed by the Standing Committee, but before going to the full House for a vote. The House Rules Committee can add a rule to the bill. That's why it's called the Rules Committee. And the rule would contain things like the date the bill will come up for debate, and the time allotted for discussion. Often it includes specifics about what kinds of amendments can be offered. 
So it's, it's such an important procedural process in how bills become law. And because it's so important, the party that controls the House Rules Committee really gets to influence the conditions under which bills get debated. And every now and then, the House Rules Committee will add something that's called a closed rule to a bill, which means that the bill cannot be amended at all. Also, in this procedural discussion, there's something called a discharge petition. This is a petition that gives a majority of the House of Representatives the authority to bring an issue to the floor in, f in the face of committee inaction. So if a committee is taking so long to work on a bill and a majority of the House would like to see that bill forced out of the standing committee, then if there's a majority of the members of House that decide to vote yay, they can issue a discharge petition and the bill would be forced out of committee. So if everybody's voting, that would be 218 members of the House. Now here's a little bit of information about the 109th Congress. So this was a few years ago, but the information is still very relevant. In the House, there are 19 standing committees with an average of 31 members. There's 86 subcommittees. Each member of the House holds on average 1.8 standing committee assignments and three subcommittee assignments. So members of the House become more policy specialists. They serve on less committees on average compared to the Senate and therefore get to focus on issues that they are experts on. They get to focus on things that they know a lot about so they become more specialized. Whereas in the Senate there's 16 standing committees so there's slightly less standing committees in the Senate than the House but because there's there's a, only a hundred senators, that means that each of those senators is serving on more standing committees. There are 68 subcommittees in the Senate, so this allows all members of the majority party in the Senate in the 109th Congress to be a committee chair. That means that each member of the Senate is serving on three to four standing committees and seven subcommittees, so members of the Senate have to be generalists. They have to be policy generalists because they are on more committees. There's less expertise and more general knowledge in the Senate. Looking at committee membership, some members of Congress can request a committee that they would like to be assigned to, to their party's selection committee, the Committee on Committees or the Steering Committees, Representatives usually try to seek committee assignments that will enable them to have access to pork. And pork is legislation that allows them to bring money and jobs to their district in the form of public works, public works programs, uh, military bases, or other programs. So an example would be somebody who serves on the Armed Services Committee would then be able to pass legislation that would bring an army base or some sort of military base or military service to their district. Pork makes it harder to defeat an incumbent because many people don't like the idea of pork, but they do like when pork happens for their district. So Robert Byrd, a Democrat from West Virginia, was known as the Prince of Pork. He brings or brought many projects back to West Virginia even a Coast Guard operation in landlocked West Virginia. Committees can be a great way for a politician to be reelected. In addition to pork, they can also give a member of Congress the opportunity to make key decisions for people in their district, for their constituents. Also, committee membership represents an opportunity to have power and influence. So if somebody can get appointed to a big committee, like the House Ways and Means Committee or the Appropriations and Budget Committees, that means that that member of Congress has a lot of power. Congress can approve programs, but unless the, the money gets appropriated, unless the money gets authorized to be spent, those programs won't happen. So being on the Appropriations Committee can be very, very important. 
Committee membership is reflective of the party distribution in either the Senate or the House. As an example, in the 109th Congress, the Republican Party, the GOP, held 229 seats. So they're the majority party in the 109th Congress. And that means they got 55% of the seats on several of the committees because of the makeup of Congress. But for committees more responsible for the operations of the House, like the Rules Committee, the majority party takes a disproportionate majority of the seats. Being a committee chair is a position of huge power and prestige. The committee chairs get to appoint subcommittee chairs. They call meetings. They can kill a bill by refusing to schedule hearings on it in their committee. They have a large staff and garner the attention of lobbyists and the media. Historically, committee chairs used to be selected on seniority how long somebody had served in Congress. But the House no longer relies on seniority when making appointments of committee chairs. It's more of a strategic decision. All right, that takes us to the end of our look at the structure of Congress, the committee system of Congress, so, so important to how Congress operates. Hope it helped. Good luck studying. Let me know at that link below if you have any comments, questions, or anything that needs clarification. Thank you.